Life is Strange True Colors is a fantastic game that offers a great story with solid pacing, and unlike previous games in the series, it left me with feeling that every choice I made mattered. In picking up where Don't Nod left off, Deck Nine has gone above and beyond to create the best game in the series to date, and I am excited to see what the studio does with it next. I have always been the type of gamer to fall in love with a knockout narrative. What with its compelling characters, captivating narrative, and a plotline that kept my eyes forever glued to the emanating blue light screen under the twin bed covers past my bedtime. Unblinking, invested, consumed. I was no longer Ashley. I was whatever beautiful gripping tale that transported me to another dimension so that when my mom came in throwing back the covers of my blanket fortress, I was physically unable to answer her simple question, why are you up so late, missy? It's because I wasn't in this life. I was in another life, fighting bad guys, kicking butt, and taking names. My digital life alter ego. Unfortunately, back in the early 2000s, there weren't many narrative-heavy games relying on real-life qualities without having the stress of timed armed war scenarios. So, whatever I could find, I latched onto as I craved interactive narrative so I could live in someone else's shoes. Alright, now fast forward some 5-10 years or so to the development of this completely revolutionary game genre, Cinematic Interactive Narrative offering a new level of visual, emotional, and social gameplay immersivity that is groundbreaking in the way future game developers base formulas and outlines to their narrative discourse success. Basically, think choose your own adventure novels, but a million times more immersive through visually stunning environments, meaningful interactivity of gameplay between characters and their environment, relatable dialogue and relationships building, exceptionally written character and plot arcs, and a captivating soundtrack that should be its own lo-fi playlist on YouTube. Oh wait, what's this? Yep, they really nailed their target audience. On that note, a game I would like to applaud for its success in its immersive, lifelike narrative and gameplay is the newest installment of the Life is Strange series, Life is Strange True Colors. In Life is Strange True Colors, you are playing as the teenage protagonist, Alex Chen. Some amount of time ago, she was diagnosed with this power curse, depending on how you interpret the narrative, that grants her the supernatural ability to embody, experience, and employ the intense emotions of others that appear as colored auras ablaze around their emotional person. She was separated from her older brother at a young age, as we learn, and after years in the foster system and therapy, she decides to go to the small town of Haven Springs, Colorado to reunite and move in with her brother. Then, tragedy strikes as her brother dies in a supposed accident. It is up to you, the player as Alex Chen, to embrace her true powers to unearth the truth and piece together some sense of very dark secrets in this small town. Along the way, you are to explore various locations, converse, and form relationships with the townspeople, as well as go on side quests to help progress the plot and obviously have fun being in the fictional world of true colors. Before diving in too far, let's quickly define narrative in the words of H. Porter Abbott. Narrative is the principal way in which our species organizes its understanding of time. And this definition goes for all narrative in order to create a believable, lifelike experience, whether it be in literature, script writing, or game development. To further illustrate this concept, Lev Manovich outlines what narrative is not in relation to the database. Database and narrative do not have the same status in computer culture. A database can support narrative, but there is nothing in the logic of the medium itself which would foster its generation. Meaning, a narrative is a description of time through a series of events or narrative discourse, not the accumulation of data points and numbers. That being said, there are three formats when it comes to the types of video game narratives. The three being linear, one direct path of the narrative discourse unfolding, no options, a singular ending, most resembles a film. Then there's string of pearls, same main narrative discourse following a linear pattern with its singular ending, but with the addition of side quests and interactions, adding to an early illusion of choice. And finally, branching narratives. This is where the butterfly effect comes in in this gameplay format. The story is reliant on the player to make decisions and participate in side quests that can and will affect the gameplay and final outcome as there are multiple possible endings throughout the game. Cinematic interactive narrative utilizes the third option in offering an experience so tailored to the gamer that it raises the observations stated by Chris Stone, 
If books, movies, television, and music seek to tell the stories of the artists behind them, then modern games tell the user's story. I mean, that's pretty mind-blowing that we have basically written a recipe for emotional empathy and investment that allows us to bond with other people, both fictional and real, through a metal shell filled with wires and filaments that flashes images and samples of catchy lo-fi hits. Anyway, these all evoke a sense of human connection with an inanimate object on a basic level. I mean, just check out these reactions. I can already tell this game is gonna bring me through a whole roller coaster, okay? Oh my god! Am I tearing up, bro? <laughs> what the Can't fuck? Undo. I trusted this guy! Bro got head chopped from the rock. No! <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god. God, that was so much. I'd be willing to wager that these gamers are pretty emotionally invested in the progression of events. It's next to impossible to not be invested as you essentially are living the life of Alex Chen and are given the ability to choose actions, conversation comments and responses that can and will alter the gameplay of the story as it unfolds. All the while interacting with emotionally engaging dialogue and compelling character development, building lifelike relationships as we can relate to these interactions on a human level, which is why this gameplay is so strong in its ability to connect with its audience. Or is it possible through experiencing such deep physically taxing emotions from this object, have we projected human connective qualities on it? This is important as our relationship with technology is evolving. Not only does it have the potential to reroute our reward system, we now have developed an emotional desire and acceptance to gaming and interactivity with others through expert narrative development, coupled with fantastic visual and auditory creation that we are essentially creating a second life, a digital alter ego slash realm, if you will. According to Scott Rigsby in his 2006 study of The Motivational Pole of Video Games, a self-determination theory approach, he boils down basic human needs and how these games are so appealing through targeting these three psychological needs. Competency, feeling successful in our endeavors. Autonomy, an innate desire for independence, which can lead to into isolation. And relatedness, the feeling of connecting and relation to others, either real or fantasy. And this has become satisfactory to many in terms of fulfilling their human need for social interaction being validated by lifelike characters with believable stories and emotions. This sounds pretty jarring as I am willing to guess you are now reconsidering that Mac, PS5, or Nintendo Switch that you just purchased is now taking advantage of your emotional and mental well-being. I'd like to argue that this is rather the opposite. In a slightly haunting way, it's kind of inspiring how we've utilized various digital mediums to convey and simulate such strong emotions through a digital screen and allowing us to not only effortlessly place ourselves in the shoes of a character to the extent we embody their life, but also to connect with people all over the world, real people, through communities and fandoms of these mediums, through the handy dandy stats board at the end of each episode, these show how others interact and interpret the same medium that you have. It's remarkable being able to connect with hypothetical people so strongly over a game or series so emotionally impactful in your experience and to see that there are other people behind the screen with vivid lives, valid interpretations. It offers another level of intimacy within the gameplay. And although this technically goes against the preachings of Lev Manovich as he claims a database simply represents the world as a list of items, the point to which a database can be interpreted as a narrative is when we, the users, give meaning to it given the relation to a character, the story and fabula and the events occurring as a result of that character, in which case these stat boards do. Thus, they can be considered as a narrative. Historically, games like Pac-Man, Snake, Pong, you name it, have never really had the emotional or psychological aspect to truly enrich gameplay to the next level. But now, we have progressed technologically, challenging gamers in a revolutionary way to play with their emotional and social capacities in a safe, simulated scenario and environment. Our gameplay features have gained the critical ingredients of a true lifelike story, simulating and substituting desired human interaction we otherwise may not have in the time that we invest in a certain game, depending on the title. I truly believe this is a powerful step towards a positive outlet of gaming, encouraging gamers of all genders, race, walks of life, sexual orientation, personalities, health status, 
to become invested in one's emotions and relate to the options and choices of others. Either that, or this is just the beginnings of a robot apocalypse. Who knows?